What's up, guys? Welcome back to the 48 Men Podcast. Today, my guest is Jarrett Johnson. Jarrett is a husband, father, former NFL football player, and also uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. Jarrett, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, appreciate you having me, Christian. Man, I'm uh, so for those of you who don't know, well, I don't know why you would know, but me and Jarrett go way back. He is a um, he's a neighbor of of mine. I guess I, I guess you could say you're a neighbor of mine. You you live next to mm-hmm. my cousins, which we uh, we're all kind of like family. So, uh, Jared, I'm looking forward to having you today, man. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, so so kind of can you give a little background? So you played at Alabama. You're from mm-hmm. Florida. You played at the Ravens for eight or nine years. You played for the mm-hmm. Chargers. So. Uh, kind of a little, a, a little backstory on, um, on all the things that you've done. Yeah. So, um, I'm originally from Florida. I was born at Homestead, uh, but I grew up in North central Florida on the West coast, uh, a really small town called uh, Cedar key. Um, Cedar keys doesn't have a football team. So when I got to high school, uh, moved inland to a somewhat smaller school, still a one, a school, but, um, yeah, I moved inland, uh, to Chiefland. Um, that was my first year playing organized football. Um, loved it. I grew up playing baseball and basketball and uh, fell in love with football the first time I played it and won a state championship and got a scholarship to go to Alabama. And I was there from 99 to 02. Um, and then got drafted to the Ravens, was there from 03 to 2011, and then finished out my career with the Chargers, retired in uh, 2015. So you didn't start playing football till high school? Yeah, I had one like summer. My, I, I, I spent some time out west. My mom used to, she was trying to get me out of Florida and she would ship me out to my, my aunt. Um, they live in Missoula, Montana. She'd ship me out there. And I played one year of a little peewee summer ball thing, but, um, but really didn't, really didn't get into it till, uh, till high school. Yeah. So when you got to high school, were you, were you playing defensive end or what were you playing? Yeah, I kind of played. I've, I've always been a defensive end, always been on the D line. Um, and, uh, started out there. Um, I made a big jump. I was like, you know, I was a fairly big kid, but not huge. I was like six, one, one eighty as a freshman for well, my junior year, or excuse me, my sophomore year, I gained like 40 pounds, 50 pounds, something like that. And so they moved me to, we ran the wing tee. So I was like a pulling guard and then played all across the defensive line. Um, and then, uh, got even bigger my junior year. By the time I graduated, I mean, I was 6'3", like 265, you know, like pretty big for a defensive end in, in, um, in high school, especially for 2A school. That's crazy. What what did you ever get to? So I always thought and this is something that, you know, if you're a young football player, like don't do. But, you know, the old school mentality was put as much weight on as possible, like get as big as possible. And, you know, the old thing about like getting up in the middle of the night and having a kid eat, drink a protein shake. And uh, it was always a, um, a, a big glass of milk and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the middle of the night and then go back to bed, uh, which is terrible. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, so I, you know, if I was to go back, I mean, obviously it worked out, so everything's fine, but um, you know, I would, anytime I talk to kids now that are, especially if they're a big kid and they're growing, like just work out, learn, educate yourself in nutrition, uh, but let your body grow naturally. Like, don't try to be, you know, in my mind, I thought I was going to, my D-line coach in high school always told me that I was going to be 300 plus pounds and be an interior D-lineman. And so I always believed that. So I was like eating like crazy. And, um, you know, when I showed up to Alabama, I was like probably 275. But I wouldn't say, you know, especially when you get to college and, the, you know, everything you eat is buffet style and you're eating late night pizzas and and whatever, like, in my opinion, like I was like, I played at Alabama. I was anywhere from 280, 285, but a lot of that was, you know, not good weight. You know, I had some, I had some, some fat on me. And if I would have just, you know, grew naturally, you know, and stayed healthy, it would have much more prepared me to being an out, a good outside linebacker. Um, once I get, got to the NFL, cause when I got to the NFL, I was still like trying to keep my weight on, but the seasons were too long. And, I would start out the season as like 285. I think one t- one year I went in at like 288. And by the end of the year, I was like 265, 270 playing de- defensive tackle. It's not ideal. Yeah. And so they, instead of a lot of times teams will just cut you. And uh, luckily they, they believed in me, you know, I'd showed some, 
So Promise was getting a little better that every year, and so they moved me to outside linebacker, and that position fit perfectly. Uh, my optimal weight was 260, 265. And if I would have done that, you know, all through my college career, you know, I would have won, went into the NFL at that, at, that, at that natural weight and been more adapted to playing with my hand, you know, playing uh, stand up. Yeah. Um, you know, because I had to kind of reinvent myself like halfway through my NFL career. I'd always played my hand in the dirt and all of a sudden they moved me to outside linebacker and I had no idea what I was doing, but luckily I adapted quickly. Yeah. Was it a culture shock at all for you going from a 2A school to, to playing at Alabama? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had no idea. No, nobody in my family ever went to college. So, you know, it was um, – you know, big culture shock, and especially when you, you, you know, you're playing with kids who went to big college or big high schools. And, you know, they had, they only played one way. They had, you know, they had a freshman team and a JV team and, you know, they, they, they washed their jerseys for them all stuff. I mean, we, we were, you know, we were as, as uh, we were roughing it as a guess. I mean, we had like, we won state. And I think we had, uh, we brought up like four kids, off of uh, the JV team to give us 24 players. So we played the majority of the season with like eight, with like 20 kids. You know, we just, and, you know, when the, we you'd flip the side, go to the other direction, you just turn around. You never came up field. You yeah. played both, both ways, you know? So, but I think, you know, that made me the player I was because I was used to being a tough, hard nosed kid and wasn't really used to like, you know, all the, you know, all the, you know, some of these kids like, um, you know, especially like when you, when you go to the NFL, there's kids from all different colleges, you know, from the Ohio States, Alabama's, Michigan's, yeah. Notre Dame's have all the money in the world. You know, they have these beautiful facilities, but they're kind of pampered. And then you'll go get some kid. You're like, well, how did that kid from Nickel State make the team? But the kid from Ohio State or Alabama got cut, yeah. you know, or this first round pick lasted three years with this kid who went to division two school, played 12. Well, usually it's their 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 mental approach to the game and their 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 just their their toughness um you know a lot of these bigger schools are pampered and whatever the kids are pampered and used to being taken care of and yeah um you got to have a lot of durability to make yeah. the nfl how much how much how much would you say is that mental aspect just as important as just being physically i mean able able to compete I mean, I would say, you know, I would, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a big portion of it, especially in the NFL. Um, Cause you, you have so much coming at you. It's your first time, um, you know, making any money. Most everybody comes from a lower end, a lower income family. Usually a lot of, a lot of single parent comes from a lot of single uh, family homes or single parent homes. Um, you know, there's a, there's a level of maturity, um, you know, that, that you got to possess to be able to make. And I would say, you know, there, there's some freaks out there. I mean, there are some unbelievable freak of nature athletes. Um, but, uh, you know, and everybody's a good athlete, but the, if you're not a freak athlete, you better have it mentally. Yeah. You, you better be able to, to withstand, um, you know, the, the mental toughness to be able to play a, a season because everybody's hurt. Uh, especially when, when, um, you know, my defense coordinator was Rex Ryan. We, you know, had a, a very extensive defense. Um, there was a lot to learn. And that's kind of how I made my way was as a backup. My first couple of years, I was a, a role player. And instead of just learning the guy was backing up, I learned everybody's position on the whole front seven. So if somebody went down, it didn't matter the position, I could go play it. And yeah. Rex loved that because he awesome. knew he could put me in any position at any time of the game. And I understood instead of just learning a line on the playbook, I learned the whole concept of the defense and what he was trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, and because I can, I was, I could handle it mentally. It just, um, you know, it, it gave me a lot more uh, chances. And then there were some other guys that came in. There were freaks of athletes, freaks of nature athletes. I mean, just off the charts good, but they couldn't pick it up mentally and they yeah. couldn't stand the pressure or they would get hurt. Um, and they would just fizzle out. You know, if I run a four eight, you run four five, but I'm breaking on the ball two seconds before you, it doesn't matter that I run four eight, you yeah. know? Yeah. I can see it and I can I can I can adapt. I can get there. Now you have a guy like Ed Reed who can 
see it and also outrun you or is also quicker than you and also very aggressive. That's when you have a hall of fame. Yeah. You know, but uh, I was obviously athletic enough to, to stay, but it was my mental toughness, my durability and my ability to uh, learn a playbook, you know, extremely quickly that that allowed me to stay in the NFL so long. Yeah. Well, because you, you also did play with some of just the best athletes. I mean, when you were on the Ravens, like you said, you had Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, yeah. Terrell Suggs, Anquan Bolden. I mean, so you were, yeah. con- you were constantly surrounded by, yeah. by freak athletes. Yeah, we had, uh, we had, you know, I'm extremely blessed. Uh, uh, and, you know, to think back at the play, in fact, I was working, I have a little gym in my house and I have all my the jerseys on the wall. And I was, I just happened to look up and I was thinking about the, the guys that are on my wall that are, that are friends of mine. I mean, there's four hall of famers mm-hmm. out of, you know, I think I got the whole starting, I believe it was the 2009 or 2010 starting defense is when I went through and got all the jerseys, but, um, you know, but I played with Deion Sanders, um, you know, obviously Ray Lewis and Ed Reed are the two big, but Haloti Nada, yeah. Terrell Suggs, um, just some unbelievable. And then with the Chargers, you know, Phil, guy like Philip Rivers and Nick Hardwick and, you know, Eric Weddle. I mean, all these guys are, um, yeah. you know, unbelievable athletes, unbelievable men. Yeah. You know, I, I took something from each one of them that I can apply to my life. Yeah. What would you say were the biggest differences going from like when you first started out from Alabama to, to Baltimore, what was the biggest difference? And then from Baltimore to, to, um, to San Diego, like training, so the like, biggest, like training wise, culturally. Yeah. So the biggest difference um, that, you know, you think, you know, what the NFL is when you're in college, because you got buddies that, that, you know, maybe played a couple of years with a team or you got a buddy that get drafted or, you know, you hear things, guys coming home, but you really don't know until you get there. But I, I think the biggest difference, other than the, the speed of the game, is how guys can process mentally. Um, and then when they get there, how violent the guys were. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's you go from playing with boys, like they look like men, but they're boys. Yeah. You get to the NFL and you're playing, you know, you're backing up a dude or going up against a dude that's 30 years old. He's got, you know, he's, seen he's got some family things. to feed. Dude, yeah. this guy's lived life, man. He's got <laughs> he's got an ex-wife with a couple kids. He's got a mortgage. He bought his mama a house. Like, and and, and you think you're gonna stand in his way? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's a just a different level of intensity. Um, and the other thing is just the mental side of the game. Like I, it was just unbelievable how quick guys could process and see a play develop and react. Um, and it was one of the ways that I was able to catch up and, and, you know, be competitive is because I learned a process super fast, but, you know, the seasons are really long. It was 16 games when I played at 17. Now it's just a long season. You'll play four preseason games, start a training camp and, you know, uh, mid July, um, you know, you, 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 you play, you don't play in your first preseason game until mid August. It's just a long, long season when you start the season in mid-July and, you you know, you might be finishing in February. Um, so, and then culturally, um, you know, you're playing with guys from all over the country. You know, when I was at Alabama, um, now guys, you know, kind of get out of their territory and, we'll, mm-hmm. you know, recruiting is more national now. Then it was more regional. Kids t- it tended to stay in their state or at least in their region of the country. If you're southeast guy, you stay in southeast. Um, but uh, when you get to the NFL, I mean, you got guys from all over, you got guys from California, Hawaii, the Northeast, um, you know, so culturally it's, it's a big difference. You know, you start playing with some guys from, from, uh, from Oakland, California, you know, and you're from a little bitty town in Alabama or a little bitty town in Florida. It's culture shock. You know what I mean? Um, Baltimore, I, I, uh, preferred Baltimore's culture. It was like a, it's like a warrior's mentality. There was no joking around. Mm-hmm. There was no going out to eat before the game. You guys were super intense, super serious. You know, Ray Lewis was our leader, um, and he's the one who set the tone. And, you know, it, it sounds kind of corny, but, I mean, he really worked and acted like – just like a, if you ever seen the movie Ake- – or um, Troy. It's a bad Brad Pitt movie with – Yeah, it's Troy yeah. with Achilles. I mean, that's what he acted like. Yeah. And that's the way he viewed the game. And – that's just the way he was. And then San Diego, when I went out there, 
Uh, it was a lot different. It was more laid back because um, we were on the West Coast. The vast majority of our trips were two-day trips, you know, so it was not much to go out to eat and go sightsee, you know, and yeah. go into a game. Yeah. Um, so it was much more chill, but I still enjoyed it. Yeah. It great friends out there. Um, you know, so culturally, they, they were they were different, yeah. for sure. Do, mo- do most NFL teams sort of adopt the same, like, workout regimen routines or, or like was 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 baltimore contrastly different than than san diego or is, was things pretty similar so when i got to baltimore you know i people are shocked when i tell them when i tell them this but um strength and conditioning is one of been the one of the last things that have um it, that that have come along in the nfl and when i got to baltimore um, we had a fairly good strength program when I was at Alabama, not great, but it was pretty good. When I got to Baltimore, I mean, it was that whole, that old school hammer strength, mm-hmm. you know, everything was equipment and it was all one set of failure. You'd start on a line of equipment and it was one set of failure all the way to the end. And then you were done. And then the next day it would be legs and it was same thing all the way down the line and That's you were crazy. done. And, um, most guys in those days, um, once they got older and established themselves on the team, they'd go elsewhere and they would either go back to where they trained for the combine um, or they would find a personal trainer. And um, I started working with a trainer who actually became Baltimore strength and conditioning coach. He's still there today. His name's Steve Saunders. And he was amazing. He, awesome. He's the one that taught me about uh, nutrition. I knew nothing about nutrition. Uh, when, I, when I was at Alabama, I mean, Thursday night would be like all you can eat wing night. You know, um, Wednesday night was like steak night and they'd have those cheap, thin ribeye steaks, uh-huh. you know, yeah. and you could eat as many of them as you want, you know, and French fries and ice cream and like all this crap. And, you know, I mean, in my mind, <laughs> with Baltimore, you know, I'd go out and <laughs> eat as many chicken wings as I wanted and drink some beer and be like, there's my protein and carbs yeah. right there, babe. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I had no clue. Yeah. Um, and so, but Steve taught me about nutrition, maybe understand how many calories I was taking in and, and how many bad calories. And, um, he changed my body and you know, I showed up my first year after working out with him, I showed up to training camp. I was 275 and probably the best shape of my life. Yeah. Next year I was even lighter. Um, it was more explosive, faster, um, a lot more functional strength stuff, um, you know, did a lot of resistance, uh, call it time under tension. So you would work out with a, like a, you know, a dumbbell or barbell or whatever it was, but yeah. you would attach rubber bands to it. You know, it would be a slow negative to a pause and then an explosion up. Um, so, you know, I, 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 you know, got, I wouldn't say as strong as I was in college, Pro- probably was close. Um, but just my physical strength, like what I call old man strength, you yeah. know, when you grab, you know, you know, that old man, you go to shake his hand, you his hand feels uh-huh. like a brick. Yeah. You know, I, I learned that and got that from working out with Steve. Yeah. Um, I would say the teams today have come a long ways. They yeah. have, they've learned, they're trying to keep their guys in house. So in order to do that, they had to modernize their strength and conditioning program. Most yeah. teams has, have nutritionists now. It's, it's way better. When you started getting more serious with the nutrition, could you tell the difference in, in performance? Yeah, I mean, 100%. 100%. And as you get older, um, as your metabolism slows down, you know, when you're young and your metabolism's like through the roof, Yeah. Um, you can essentially, I, I wouldn't say you can eat whatever you want, but you can get away with some cheap meals and you can get away with, you know, eating whatever. You know, I was watching that, what's the uh, receiver place for – Seattle, big oh, giant guy um, played yeah, on the- DK Metcalf. Yeah, Metcalf. Yeah, see, I, you know, his diet, he, I, all he eats is candy. I don't believe it. He, he, I, I don't dude, believe I, it. I, there's some of those guys are just freaks of nature and, and, and they're out there. Um, but the vast majority of to the average person, um, you know, when you're younger, you can get away with some cheap meals. But as you get older, your nutrition has to, has, has to catch up. You know, especially now that I'm retired, that's yeah. the biggest thing that's changed is how I eat. Yeah. And what I eat. Yeah. So going from playing, you know, at Baltimore and then and then to San Diego, what was it? What was the biggest? Um, I don't know. Maybe hurdle hurdle that you walked through after hanging up the cleats, or what did you? You know, how did you process going from playing in the NFL for that many years to to not playing in the NFL anymore? 
Yeah, you know, it, it, we go through a million meetings and stuff about transitioning out of the NFL, and in your mind, um, you think you're prepared for it. You know, I was a guy that I didn't like like to identify myself as just a football player. I always had hobbies outside of ball. Um, I used to hate telling people that I played in the NFL um, just because they would automatically change their perception of you, whether it's for the good or the bad. Yeah. Um, you know, so I thought in my mind I was mentally prepared to, to be on the outside and be away from ball. And, you know, my first couple of months went okay. But once it came time for minicamp, you know, when your body clock is telling you, all right, it's time to, you know, show up for minicamp or training camp time, like, you know, I kind of went deeper down a hole. And then once the season started, um, at the beginning of the season, I was enjoying just sitting back and watching ball and, you know, not worrying about dealing with injuries or whatever else. But um, mentally, you know, I was really struggling. And it took me a while to um, to process, you know, how to live without football mm-hmm. and, um, you know, to, to where to put your energy. I, I got one of my old teammates, Nick Hardwick. He's got a great analogy that, that – uh, playing a sport, playing a professional sport. Um, it's difficult, but the easy part about it is it's like traveling down a road yeah. and there's all these signs and indicators telling you what to do. Don't go down this path. Don't go, everything's, um, on a schedule, uh, extreme creatures of habit. Um, and as long as you stay on that road, you know, and you don't run off in the ditch and you could stay healthy. Um, you're, you're going to be fine. Retirement, when that road ends, retirement is just like, is like being in this giant open meadow. Yeah. No signs, no indicators, but there's also no direction. You can walk in any way, any direction you want to go. You want to start a restaurant? Go start a restaurant. You want to be a real estate developer? Go do that. You yeah. want to, you know, go coach? You want to go whatever? But that's fine. Go go pick one. Yeah. And that freedom can be paralyzing when you have done something super hyper focused for 20 plus years counting yeah. your high school and college years um and now they say okay now what are you and you're like i'm 34 years old you know i've got all the resources in the world but i don't know which ones are right i don't know who i am without football so it took me a while and it takes most guys very very few guys um get through that that process um um, quickly, you know, it took me several years to to really hone in. I really feel like just now, in the last like year or so, I've really come to grips and and understood like how I'm supposed to live my my life without football. Um, and it's you know it's 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 taken a while. Yeah, what role what role did your faith play in that? Because I mean, you know, as a believer, you know, it's that our sport or our job isn't our right, isn't not our identity, but we all still struggle, you know, whatever, whatever we put right. in place to God, we, that we can view that as an idol. We idolize. So there's thousands of things that we can idolize. So for you as a, as a believer and a person of faith, how do you feel like having that background and having that relationship helped you going into, going into retirement? And, and did you see people well, that, that weren't believers that, that actually did really struggle with that open field, like you were talking about? Uh, you know, I think, I think that, um, that, you know, that everybody I know deals with it, whether they're a believer or not. But I would say the one thing that my faith um, has done for me is, is, you know, I've, I've always, one of the greatest lines I've ever heard is always give to something greater than yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, you know, and for, for me, um, you know, my faith, my family, and then now, you know, what I'm doing currently um, is if you, if, if you can give back and have a, and, and put a purpose into your life and have a belief that, um, that everything is not about you and your feelings. I think a lot of times when people are hurt or in a dark spot, um, you know, they're simply focusing on their own feelings and their own emotions. And, um, if you can give back, um, to something else, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, whether it is your faith or your family or, you know, um, you know, uh, it, it could be coaching at a high school team and bringing some young people up, you know, inspiring them. Um, you know, for me, it, it took me a while, you know, I had, uh, my mom is, uh, Episcopal and she's got a, 
her priest is an amazing guy. He lives in Gainesville, Florida. And, you know, I was a couple of years ago, I was in a dark place and went and spent the weekend with him. We just, you know, had some man time, you know, smoked cigars, yeah. prayed, you know, read the word. Um, and that was a turning point. That weekend was a turning point in my life. Um, and, you know, I've always, you know, obviously, you know, had my struggles and um, always dealt with my issues. Um, but I can always fall back on the word and always fall back on, on Christ and, 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 um, and it's what keeps me going. Yeah. Did you ever, like, did your faith ever change going from off season to during season? Cause you know, I've had people on the podcast <laughs> that for like baseball players, for instance, you know, there's 160, however many, however many games there are in a year and you're constantly on the road, you're constantly traveling. So for you with, you know, off season and then training camps, then you have film and all those things. So how do you, you know, navigate your off season relationship with Jesus? Because it, you know, it shouldn't change, you know, it's, 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 it's the same all around, but something as intensive as football, how do you navigate, you know, still putting that such a priority, but also needing, needing to do good, needing to do good at your job? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, it, it, you know, a lot of times during the season, and this is sad to say, but you see it a lot. You see it a lot in society, uh, especially as Americans. But um, the better times are, the less you rely on God. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think you're seeing that a lot in our culture today because we simply do have it so well. Yeah. And they're turning away because it's like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't need Christ because, you know, everything else is given to me and everything else is provided. Um, I, my faith was better when things were hard. Yeah. You know, when, when we had a bad season or I was dealing with injuries, um, 2009, I was dealing with, um, two, two hurt shoulders. Um, and I pulled my calf and, um, was playing with them. And, um, and my faith has probably <laughs> never been stronger yeah. you know, because I could, I could, I couldn't do it on my own. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, so, um, and yeah, you know, I believe that. I, I believe that, that, um, you know, you're, you see that a lot in today's society is, you know, if more and more people are falling away from the church, more and more young people are finding things outside of youth groups or small groups or, or whatever, because, you know, they have everything that they need. They, 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 they don't, they don't rely on, on Christ because, everything's provided. And I, I think that that's, um, that's a, good, a huge detriment just to our society in particular. Yeah, for sure. What was the season that you played with like a broke finger for the whole year? <laughs> that was 2007. I broke my thumb. Um, 2008, I had something at the end of the year. I forgot what it was. 2009 was my, um, oh, you're probably talking about the year I was with the Chargers. Yeah, I tore my UCL on my left hand and I broke my right thumb. Yeah, so I had like yeah, this yeah. big arm brace and then a giant cast. And then I like cracked some. I had, yeah, I remember I ran into one of my old teammates. He was doing like sideline, he was like the sideline reporter. And I came running up to him before the game. And he's like, Good Lord, son, you get in a car wreck. What's wrong with you? Yeah, I had bandages and casts and stuff all over the place. You Did know? you ever have but, a season um, where you where you didn't get injured like that? Or pretty much where you just yeah, banged play, up I, every season. Yeah, I mean, I played in 129 consecutive games. I miss I only missed seven games in 12 years. So, That's you know, I, as durability goes, I mean, I was pretty durable. But it, you're always dealing with something, you know, whether it's a something stupid like I, I busted a bursa sack on my knee yeah. and it just fills up with blood and you had to get it drained. And it's not like a huge deal, but, I mean, it's it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And you're like, your whole calf yeah. is purple. Um, you know, you always got like a pulled muscle or, a, you know, yeah. there's, there's literally when you watch an NFL game, yeah, everybody on the field is hurt. Yeah. And I remember we used to all show up first day of training camp and everybody's all yoked up from off season workout and feeling great. And then we were all looked at each other. and was like, all right, it's downhill slide yeah. from here. I mean, this is the best you're going to feel, feel all season. Do you think if you didn't play football that you would have been in the military? Or what do you think you would have done? Um, probably. I mean, yeah. if I look back now, I mean, definitely, um, I'd have been in the military or, uh, I remember me and my cousin, we had an agreement. Um, cause like I said, I spent a lot of time out in Montana, me and my cousin from Montana, we were going to be, 
um, either um, crab fishermen in Alaska. And this is before Deadly's Catch. We were going to be crab fishermen in Alaska or we were um, going to work for the Forest Service. That's awesome. Be like, you know, smoke jumpers or yeah. whatever. So that, yeah. that was my plan if I didn't go to the NFL. I definitely wasn't going to use my college degree, which – yeah. No. <laughs> well, just, well, I mean, well, just because hearing you talk, I mean, yeah, I think I think people don't realize how much. I mean, because you really are playing injured almost like every game, and it's definitely not for the faint of heart. I mean, I I cannot imagine playing football with a broke, whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's just that, yeah. would, that just sounds miserable. I uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's but it's it's you know like the year that the first year I played with the cast, I mean, I didn't have a backup. And I remember the doctors said that I was, I might have to have surgery. And I remember going up to my position coach, he called me up for a meeting in his office and he was like, yeah, so I hear that you might have to have surgery. And I was like, yeah, that's what they're saying. He's like, was there an option? And I was like, I, I'm sure there is. And he was like, well, yeah, we're opting not to have surgery. Right. And I was like, uh, I don't know. And he was like, no, we're not, we're not having surgery. Right. And I was like, Oh yes, sir. We're not. He's like, all right, I'll see you later. You know, <laughs> so see, 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 yeah. pe- see, people would never know stories like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's definitely two sides of the game is what you see and what you hear. And then there's what actually goes on. And I, I wish like, cause a lot of, you know, it's, it's, I mean, there's, it's real, man. It's, it's, um, it is, um, you know, there's a lot at stake and there's a lot on the line and there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And you know, it's to me it's a beautiful thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I loved it. Yeah. And uh you know, stressful, but I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah. So as I um as I said earlier, I mean, you know, hearing you talk, you are a uh yeah, you played NFL for, for for many years, but you also have two daughters, so you also have have a soft side, which I'm sure most people yeah. wouldn't wouldn't expect. But what have you learned the most about you know, just yourself becoming a dad and what do you love most about, about being a father? Well, I mean, uh, you know, that, that, um, you know, football, you know, in sports in general, but football in particular, you know, emotions drive performance. So I can get really, really mad and really intense and that intensity and that emotion is rewarded with, um, is, is rewarded in the way you play and it's, yeah. it's a motivating thing. Um, in the real world and especially dealing with your family, and especially uh, kids is you have to learn to set your emotions aside. You have to learn to be, to be patient and, you know, slow your tongue and not react you yeah. know, to situations. Um, and it's, I'm still learning today. Yeah. <laughs> I mess up all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause I, I pop hot like super quick and, <laughs> A lot of times it's you get a really negative result of, of, of your emotions. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that, that, um, that, that, I've, that I've learned stepping away from ball and, and then just being a, a dad. And, and um, now I own, I own a small business and, um, you know, dealing with employees. And, you know, we, we have uh, employees that are high school kids, 16 years old, all the way up to, to older, you know, people, you know, up in their 60s, you know, I mean, so. Yeah. There's all all walks of life, all ranges, and you know, just slowing your emotions and processing, and 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 uh, not being so reactive is something that I've learned uh, mainly from my from my family and and being being home with my kids, uh, you know, but also in in my business life. Yeah, yeah. How do you navigate? Because I mean, I can imagine to to differentiate those two things would be super tough. I mean. On Sundays to you know almost get as angry as you can to to perform super well, but then that night go home to your wife and kids yeah. and also like lay aside what you just yeah. went through. So how do you? I mean, you know, as you said that you're still learning, but how do you intentionally try to navigate differentiating those two things? Yeah, I mean you you have to you have to separate the two. You know, guys that are you know I've got a lot of buddies that that are former military, spent a lot of years in combat, multiple deployments, and you know, I mean, if you think like what what we did as football players was tough going from a super intense game yeah. to coming home. Well, imagine going on a six month combat deployment to Afghanistan or Iraq and then coming home and dealing with troubles of home, people cutting you off in traffic and, and all these things. And, and guys have a hard time separating the two, but it's, it's something that you have to do. Um, and the problem is, is 
nobody understands what you're going through except for people that have, ex- have experienced. And that's why it's so important to stay close with your, with your buddies, yeah. uh, to check up on your buddies. Um, you know, like I've got a really, really good friend group in my, um, you know, with my, um, with my, with my, some of my former teammates and, you know, I've got like three or four text mess, text message groups that, that are always popping off. We're just checking on each other or just talking or, you know, whatever, just shooting the bull. Cause you know, if you're going through a, 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 a tough time, they're the only ones that are going to understand it. You know, and, you know, especially when you play a professional sport, like, oh, you guys make all that money, you know, you guys be fine, like whatever. Well, you know, vast majority of them don't do well when they retire. Vast majority of them go broke or divorced or, you know, um, they're not living well. Um, um, you know, and you see the same thing with my buddies in the military, you know, suicide rate is extremely high, um, you know, substance abuse, you know, all those things. And, nobody can truly understand what they go through except for other combat vets. Yeah. Um, and so it's so important for them to, um, to rely on each other, to, to rely on their faith and to find something to give back to. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Jared. Well, I know, I mean, I know that I know you well, I've known you for the last like 10 years, but it was super cool hearing some of the stories <laughs> in depth of, you know, of, of more stuff that I, I just didn't know. And, Something that we typically do on the podcast when we end, we um, ask each guest to give a spiritual challenge and then also a physical challenge to go out and do during the week just to keep up with, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like as men, it's fun to, to constantly set challenges for yourself and to, you know, to try to achieve them, try to work towards them. So what spiritual challenge and physical challenge do you give? Oh, let's see. So um I would say um, my spiritual challenge, you know, I'm an audio bug guy. Yeah. Like I always have an audio bug going at all times. Um, and, you know, my challenge would be um, something that, that I love to do. So I get up early before my family does, make a pot of coffee and put on my, my, um, my earphones and I turn on a book yeah. and I start the day listening to a book. Um, you know, a lot of them are, are, um, faith-based, um, some of them are not some of them, but I love, I love books that challenge your mind and that make you think, um, some of my favorite books, um, the second mountain, the, um, the crisis comfort, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the comfort crisis, um, the four agreements, um, trying to think of some other great ones, uh, chop wood, carry water. Um, listen to something like that. Um, yeah. Any John Eldridge book as a man, yeah. you should John have all of John Eldridge books. Yeah. Um, he's an, an amazing guy. Um, and then for a physical challenge, um, you know, I try to get up and do 30 minutes of hard cardio hit style workouts every day. Um, and it's 30 minutes, some strength stuff built in. Um, but that would be my, my, my physical challenge is, get up and do something difficult, red line as hard as you can go. And I don't care if it's, you just start doing burpees or you just start doing jumping jacks or something. Yeah. But red line for 30 minutes a day for seven days and then see if your body doesn't, your, you don't create a healthy habit. that's going to make you a better person. Yeah. Do you ever listen to an audio book while you're doing those hit workouts? I do actually. I do. I'm kind of weird like that. Like most guys are listening to, gangster rap or yeah. rock or something i'm listening to john eldridge <laughs> see, see no that's good I mean, that's what i always tell people i'm like because because earlier i was doing something and it was like how do you you know how do you fight against dealing with comparison and and um you know idolizing stuff in the gym and i'm like a lot of it's what you're putting in you know i, I was like if i'm yeah. listen, if i'm listening to drake and i'm at the gym then I'm looking at, I'm, I'm thinking about what I look like in the mirror, but if I'm listening to a sermon or if I'm listening to worship, it's easier for me not to think about myself. So yep, that's 100%. for me. So there you go. You're on the John Eldridge train. <laughs> that's right, buddy. Awesome. Jared, man, well, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, you're the man. All right, brother. Love you, man. Love and, uh, you too. And you get back around these parts. I will. I will.